All right, I think um, we'll start the session. So welcome everyone to today to um, the Health Terminology Standards Virtual Mini Conference in incorporating the social determinants of health into digital health systems. Um, while we wait for everyone to, to just join, feel free to use the chat to introduce yourself and to the group and, and where you're from um, and where you're calling in from today. Uh, before we begin, I want to acknowledge with respect to the la land of the Lekwungen peoples, known today as the Songhees and Esquimalt Nation, and the Wasanich people, all whose culture, the spirit of its people, and connection with the land and Salish Sea continue to this day. With the presentation based on the social determinants of health, uh, it brings to light the importance of engaging in anti-colonial actions to address the historical and ongoing inequities experienced by Indigenous communities. The mini conference is part of the Health Terminology Standards lecture series, seminar series from the School of Health Information Science from the University of Victoria uh, and is being hosted by Canada Health Infoway and the Canadian Institute of Health Information. It is also a way to launch the new working group um, that I'll be co-facilitating with Dr. Annalyn Coughlin, um, which is being hosted through Canada Health Infoway and we're going to be looking at social determinants of health. Um, so if you want further information, uh, I'll provide that at, at the end of the session. Uh, today you will be hearing from Julie Stratton, who is this uh, senior researcher at the Canadian um, Institute of Health Information, and she's part of the Canadian Population Health Initiative. Then we'll have Andrew Pinto, who will be um, presenting on social terms of health from the SPARC study in the Upstream Lab. Uh, and he is a clinical scientist at St. Michael's Hospital and founder of the Upstream Lab. And then we'll end with Sarah DeSilvi, who is the Director of Clinical Informatics and um, has been orchestrating the Gravity Project. And she is also from Northwestern Georgia Health Center and a clinical instructor at the University of Vermont. In case you're not able to attend all of these sessions, we will be recording them um, and be sending out the link after the uh, sessions to let you know where you can find them. Um, we'll be posting them both, I believe, at UVic and on the InfoWay site. For answering questions, you there's two chat windows. You, there's two windows at the bottom. You'll see. So there's the chat where you can um, speak to everyone in the in who's attending today. And then for questions, if you can use the Q and A section, um, we'll be do answering questions at the end of the session, and um, at, and uh, having about a 15 minute question period, and then taking a 10 minute break so we can get up and stretch before we go to the next presentation. Uh, so. I'd like to begin by welcoming Julie Stratton, who is our first speaker. Um, Julie Stratton is a senior researcher with the Population and Indigenous Health Division at Kai Hai uh, and has a Bachelor of Science in Environmental Health and a Master of Health Science in Community Health and Epidemiology from the University of Toronto. Julie has spent the majority of her career in the public health sector, working at the local and federal level. Uh, she has experience in analysis and reporting on population health data from a socially determined of health perspective and has continued this work with the Canadian Institute for Health Information. So thanks. Welcome, Julie, and I will turn it over to you. Great. Thank you, Marcy. Good morning, everyone. Um, as Marcy said, my name is Julie Stratton and I am the Senior Researcher with Population and Indigenous Health Branch at Kai Hai. Really happy to be here today to speak to you about the social determinants of health and actually equity collection and reporting standards at Kai Hai. Before I start, I'd like to acknowledge that where I'm speaking today um, is on the traditional territories of the Wendat, the Anishinaabek Nation, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy and the treaty lands of the territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit and recognize that this land is now home to many of the diverse First Nations Inui and Métis people. Next slide, please. Sorry. During my presentation today, I will provide an overview of the structural and social determinants of health, talk about the work Kai and has done it related to equity and future equity work. Next slide. I want to start this presentation by orienting you to uh, just a couple of terms and definitions. This slide shows a visual of the various structural and social determinants of health. The left hand side shows examples of structural determinants which are defined as the root causes of health inequalities. Structural determinants are those things that affect whether resources for health are distributed equally in society. 
Some examples on the left-hand side include social policies like housing and the labor market or public policies such as education and health. As you move toward the right-hand side of the slide, you get more into what is called what are called the social determinants of health, which are defined as social and economic factors that can have an impact on health. And some examples of these include education, income, and occupation. This presentation will focus more on how Kai Hai is thinking about the social determinants of health in terms of how to define, measure, and analyze. Next slide. This visual from BCCDC shows the many different types of social determinants of health. These will be familiar, familiar to many of you. It includes things like income and education, gender, race and racism. And while these concepts are not new, they've really been brought to people's attention over the past year as it relates to the COVID-19 pandemic. Before I get further into the slide deck, I'm gonna show a short video just to give an introduction to the determinants of health and measuring these inequalities. In Canada, we take pride in our universal, publicly funded health system. As Canadian residents, we have free access to physician and hospital services no matter what part of the country we live in, where we've immigrated from, or where we work. However, access to health care is one of the many factors that determine health. Health care systems also need to consider things such as social supports, healthy child development, physical environments, income, and education. These factors are called determinants of health and play an important role in contributing to healthy populations. Meet Eddie. He lives in a low-income neighborhood where he is excited to start grade one so he can ride the bus to school. He's just been hospitalized with asthma for the third time this year. Analysis by the Canadian Institute for Health Information, also known as CAIHAI, shows that hospital admission rates for asthma have on average dropped by 50% over the past decade. This is a good thing. But what about Eddie? What if we told you that some children are admitted to hospital more often than others? Meet Sandra. She lives in a high-income neighborhood where she walks to school with her dad and will be starting grade two. She also has asthma, but hasn't been hospitalized since she was diagnosed as an infant. According to Kaihai analysis, asthma hospitalizations are one and a half times more common among children living in low-income neighborhoods like Eddie, compared to children living in high-income neighborhoods like Sandra. A difference in health across population groups, such as the low-income and high-income neighborhoods, is called a health inequality. Sometimes health inequalities are unavoidable. For instance, when a health difference can be attributed to a biological factor, like your DNA. Other times, health inequalities are unfair and avoidable. This type of inequality is considered an inequity, like differences by income level. By eliminating unfair and avoidable differences in healthcare access, for example, we can achieve a more equitable health system. Measuring and understanding health inequalities is a critical first step towards informing action to improve health equity. This is because averages do not tell the full story. For example, earlier we told you that the average asthma hospitalization rate has decreased in the last decade. However, looking at the overall average does not show how many more kids are being hospitalized from Eddie's neighborhood compared to Sandra's. Healthcare systems can use information on health inequalities as they seek to improve access to quality care and health outcomes. Ultimately, health systems strive to ensure that these improvements are shared across the entire population. So how exactly do we measure inequalities? We can do this by measuring and reporting on indicators by population groups, such as Canadians living in richer and poorer neighborhoods like Eddie and Sandra. We call this equity stratification. At Kaihai, we stratify indicators in different ways, including by age and sex, and increasingly by neighborhood-level income and geography. In collaboration with experts across the country, Kaihai has developed standard definitions for equity stratifiers to support analysts with measuring health inequalities. These definitions are featured in a toolkit, which is designed to help you plan your analysis, analyze your data, and report your findings. 
Using this Kai Hai Toolkit, you can identify health differences and monitor progress towards closing the gap between subpopulations. Equipped with information on health inequalities, you can continue to improve health and healthcare service delivery for all Canadians. For more information and training, visit kaihai.ca. Next slide, please. So that, that uh, video was a great overview of uh, social determinants in general, started to get into a measurement and some definitions. So I'm gonna go into a little bit more detail now with, in the rest of this presentation around what you just saw in that video. Um, first, a couple of definitions. The first is health equity, which was mentioned. This is defined as the absence of unjust, avoidable differences in healthcare access, quality, or outcomes. It is a judgment, meaning that you make a determination that there is equity or inequity. Now, I'm sure that many of you have seen this image that provides a great visual of the difference between equality and equity. The people on the left all have the same size box, which in theory means they should all be able to get their apple because they're all getting equal treatment. However, the people are all different sizes and some just can't reach that apple. And because of this, you might say there's inequity at this apple farm. So in order to change this, different size boxes have been provided to the people depending on their need. And this ensures that everyone can reach an apple, which brings equity. Next slide. The other two terms I wanna mention are health inequality and equity stratifier. Health inequality is defined as the measured difference between subpopulations. You can assess this difference by cross-tabulating your health data using equity stratifiers or determinants. An equity stratifier is defined as those characteristics, usually the social determinants of health, such as age, sex, and income, that you can use in an analysis of your data to determine inequalities between groups. Next slide. So in the next few slides, I'm gonna provide an overview of what Kai Hai is doing as it relates to uh, this equity work. And you will see the term equity used a lot in Kai Hai products. This is because Kai Hai's goal is to advance health equity. Next slide. Kai Hai has been publishing reports with inequality measurements in it for many years. Um, and in 2016, hosted a formal stakeholder dialogue on data and measurement in order to further advance health equity work. Participants in this dialogue represented ministries of health, quality councils, health regions, academia, practitioners, and national organizations and the federal government. Uh, they all shared their perspective, perspectives on priority data needs to facilitate the measurement of equity in healthcare. While there were many stratifiers uh, that were discussed, participants identified race, ethnicity, and Aboriginal identity alongside age, sex, gender, education, income, and geographic location as, a pri as priority equity stratifiers for development. The, those are the ones highlighted in um, bold white. This group of dialogue participants called on Kai Hai to establish working groups to, ref to refine and review stratifier definitions, as well as to discuss how to access and or collect stratifier data. Next slide. As a result of this dialogue in 2018, Kai Hai released In Pursuit of Health Equity, Defining Stratifiers for Measuring Health Inequality. In conjunction with Statistics Canada and external stakeholders, Kai Hai developed standards for how to measure age, sex, which is defined as sex assigned at birth, gender, defined as lived gender, income, education, and geographic location, which was defined as urban and rural remote. Next slide. This slide just gives an overview of each of the developed stratifiers, the associated construct it is intended to measure and how they are measured. For example, the stratifier sex is defined in this document as sex assigned at birth with male and female as the valid options. Next steps um, in this area of, of work around the standards are to continue to add new stratifiers to this repository and to explore opportunities to include uh, stratifiers within Kai Hai databases. For example, you know, are there ways that we can conduct data linkage in order to get them into our holdings? 
Following that report in 2020, CAIHAI released draft standards for race-based and Indigenous identity. Next slide. In this document, race is defined differently than ethnicity, where race is a social construct used to categorize people based on perceived physical differences, such as skin color or facial features. Now, there there is no biological basis for these distinctions. However, desegregation of health indicators by race can be used to identify, monitor, and address inequalities that might be the result of bias and racism. Uh, sorry, can you move to the next slide? Ethnicity is a multidimensional concept referring to cultural group membership. It may be connected to language, religious affiliation, or nationality, among other characteristics. Ethnicity data can also be useful for tailoring culturally appropriate health services and understanding diversity. Race and ethnicity are frequently misunderstood and are often conflated in health um, data collection standards, surveys, and discourse. And a better understanding of these terms will allow for improved data collection on population subgroups. Next slide. This is Kai Hai's proposed race-based standard adapted from the Ontario Anti-Racism Directorate using a preamble from the Upstream Lab Spark Study for Primary Care. This is a self-reported, self-identified approach to measuring race and respondents can select all categories that apply. Kai Hai has also included Indigenous identity as a group within the race-based question to reflect how Indigenous people may be racialized by society. This standard was used by many public health organizations across the country as part of the COVID-19 response. Next slide. Indigenous identity data are often collected alongside racial and ethnic categories during data collection. Although Indigenous populations experience racism and have their own unique cultures, they may not identify as racial or ethnic groups. So we've included in the proposed standards a separate question for Indigenous identity that is distinctions-based and separates out First Nations, Inuit, and Métis groups, allowing for additional self-identification. There is a need to respect Indigenous self-determination and data governance in this space to minimize any risks of harm. We've learned through our work to date that Indigenous identity data and measurement should be determined and supported by Indigenous communities. Uh, we are in the process now of engaging with Indigenous organizations, communities, and researchers for feedback on this approach. And we're approaching this engagement in alignment with Kai Hai's Indigenous Health Strategy and with the collaboration of uh, Kai Hai's Indigenous Health Team. Kai Hai also encourages organizations implementing data collection to engage and collaborate with Indigenous communities in their jurisdictions to find out how they prefer to be identified. Next steps in this area are to publish a what we heard report based on our stakeholder engagement, followed by finalized standards in early 2022. Next slide. While not in scope for this year, considerations for the expansion of stratifiers could include the following, housing, disability, language for receiving care, health insurance, immigrant status, and sexual orientation. Um, and I just wanted to flag that the process that was used to identify these concepts within the Pan-Canadian Canadian dialogue consisted of um, a variety of different approaches, in-person consensus building exercises, uh, sur reviewing survey results of potential stratifiers, round robin exercises, and uh, ranking and then selection. Next slide. I also wanted to add that um, in, in determining these stratifiers, we used the following criteria. Strength of association, strength, sorry, strength of evidence, meaning that the stratifier is associated with access, quality, and or outcomes of healthcare. Accountability, meaning that inequality can be addressed through a policy or program intervention at the clinical or, or healthcare system level. Accessibility and use, meaning that a definition exists that is standard, valid, and reliable, and has been used to measure inequality in healthcare. Acceptability, meaning that the stratifier information would be willingly provided by Canadians without concerns over privacy and or data ownership. And relevance, meaning the stratifier reflects a priority population for improving access, quality, and outcomes of healthcare. Next slide. 
Following the Equity Stratifier Report, a toolkit on measuring health inequalities was created that helps users to plan their analysis, provides guidance for analysis of data, and how to report findings uh, with, with uh, additional links for um, other resources. Next slide. When planning your analysis, it is recommended that you identify your stratifiers, determine how you want to disaggregate, and then obtain your data, which can be used to create your analyst, an analytical plan. Within this slide are resources that are part of the Inequalities Toolkit, which can help with planning your approach. Next slide. Likewise, for the analysis phase, there is guidance and resources for conducting your stratified analysis and identifying inequalities using various summary measures. Next slide. So a little bit about inequality measures here. There are many different types, though there are those that measure absolute uh, inequalities and ones that measure relative inequalities. And there are also distinctions between simple and complex measures. Next slide. For ease of understanding and reporting, it is best to consider a combination of both simple and complex, as well as absolute, which is difference-based, and relative, ratio-based measures. Kaihai has selected the measures in red as ones that are more easily understood by a wider audience of users and ones that provide a comprehensive description of health inequality that reduces reporting bias. Next slide. Uh, and now I'm just going to go over a few examples here about how they can be used and what the interpretation would be. So next slide. The rate ratio um, is defined here as a simple measure of the relative inequality between subgroups that is calculated by dividing the rate of the lowest income quintile by the highest income quintile in this example. For example, dividing income quintile Q1 by Q5 gives you a number of 2.4. This means that the rate of whatever it is you're measuring is 2.4 times higher in the lowest quintile compared to the highest income quintile. Next slide. The rate, uh, sorry, next slide. The rate difference is a simple measure of the absolute inequality between subgroups that is calculated by subtracting the rate in the lowest versus the highest income quintile. And in this example, we get a number of 93, which simply means that there's a difference in the rate of whatever it is you're measuring between the lowest and highest income quintile of 93 per 100,000. Next slide. The potential rate reduction is a complex measure of relative inequality that captures the potential reduction in a health indicator that would occur in the scenario, hypothetical scenario, that each population subgroup experiences the same low rate as the subgroup with the most desirable rate. It's also commonly known as population attributable fraction or population attributable risk. And then the interpretation here with our, our result is that approximately 30% of outcome X could have been avoided if all income quintiles had the same rate as that in the highest income quintile. And finally, next slide, the last one that I will talk to you about is the population impact number, which is defined as a complex measure uh, and, and it's absolute in terms of inequality. And it looks at the potential reduction in the number of cases, not the percent, but the number of cases or events for a health indicator in the same hypothetical scenario where every subgroup that you're looking at experiences the same rate as the one with the most desirable. Um, so it captures the gradient of inequality across multiple categories. The, inter the interpretation here is that there could be approximately 9,000 fewer of outcome X if everyone in all income quintiles had the same rate as Q5. Next slide. Finally, the uh, Health Inequalities Toolkit also provides guidance for interpreting and presenting your findings along with additional resources. Next slide. A couple of the other features and resources I'm going to speak to you about, which I think are, are helpful. Um, this particular intervention scan guide um, it is helpful to inform the process from analysis to action. So once you've completed that analysis and determined your inequalities, what do you do next? 
The guide was developed to, to help you with identifying potential strategies, policies, or programs that can help reduce the health inequality that you have identified. Next slide. Um, this is a, another resource that is helpful called the Area Level um, Equity Stratifiers using the PCCF and PCCF Plus. Speaks to some key considerations when measuring um, specifically income and geography related inequalities when you're using an area based analysis approach. So, this is a, a great resource if you're planning to, to look at those two stratifiers. Um, you can use this approach when you don't have individual data about a stratifier, but that you can calculate inequalities by linking your data to higher le levels of geography for an area based approach. Next slide. The SAS Macros and Methodology Notes Toolkit is a document that provides methodological guidance for calculating indicator rates and calculating summary measures of inequalities, um, and also includes um, SAS code to go along with that. Next slide. These documents provide additional information about definitions um, related to, to equity and uh, other resources, equity related sources. Next slide. I just want to flag here too that the Health Inequalities Interactive tool provides inequality measures for selected indicators that use sex and income quintile. Um, while this is available online with data, I, I do want to note it, that while it hasn't been updated in some time, it does provide examples of analysis and how you can display inequalities data to a wider audience. Next slide. Finally, here are just a few examples of Kaihai reports that have included inequality analyses. These and other reports are listed in Kaihai's uh, listed on Kaihai's um, Health Inequalities webpage. Next slide. What's next for Kaihai? One piece of work includes the expansion of selected equity stratifiers within Kaihai databases. For example, the addition of area-based adding area-based income um, into some selected data files to help with analysis. Another activity includes the expansion of analysis and reporting of health inequalities for CHI-HI indicators. So, um, you know, if we're adding in some of these area-based variables, being, um, being able to report some of that more broadly. And finally, continued stakeholder engagement related to identification and development of future stratifiers. And that brings us to the end of my uh, presentation. I wanna thank you for attending today and I'm happy to respond to any questions. Wonderful, thank you so much, Julie. Um, lots of information there and great resources as well. So thanks for, for all of that um, information. Um, I, there's a couple of questions that came up in the chat window. Um, and Waldo, I, I believe it's from um, Infoway and has been working on looking at um, inequities as well. And so one of the questions, um, I'll just read them out loud. So there, there are white people who identify as indigenous. Similarly, there are Latinos that are identified as Caucasian. Now between race and ethnicity, which do you think has the greater impact on health inequalities is the first part of the question. Uh, and then the, um, a couple of other points that um, Waldo raises is race and ethnicity are considered as social terms of health. Uh, therefore, they can potentially generate health inequalities. And what do you think is the role of the healthcare system in fixing structural and systemic racism? Huge questions. <laughs> they are, they yeah. are, they are mm -hmm. huge, but they're they're yeah. great questions. So mm -hmm. I'm just trying to see and them. Yeah, they, and then they're, yeah, they're in the chat or they are in the Q. Then the Q and A, um, and then the the third part to that was um, you've shown different measures indicators related to every stratifier. Is there a measure indicator or index complaining all of these measures in order to measure intersectionality? Um, and actually, that's a great question because that's, my, it, that's yeah, great. yeah. Okay. Maybe we can just start. Um, I don't. I don't see. I can't don't see, see them. Yeah. No. The Q and A part. Okay. I can't see the Q and A. So if you can just yeah. um, maybe. Do you want to? So maybe the first part was. Um, so between race and ethnicity, which do you think has a greater impact on health inequalities? Yeah. Now I don't think I can say which one has greater impact. Yeah. I think they both have value. Uh, 
in, in this space. So I think like earlier in my slide deck, it depends what you're, you wanna be measuring and, and what the intention is. So ethnicity may have, they may have the opportunity to give you insight into, some, depending it is what you're looking for, race. Race is a great measure for um, looking at the potential of systemic racism. So it, you, you need to, you should probably disaggregate if you can. It's not easy because those data are not routinely collected, but I would say they both have some value um, depending on what you are trying to achieve. Yeah, great. Um, and maybe I guess a follow up kind of to, to this is what I've been thinking about too is um, and ties into the intersectionality question that Waldo raised was with COVID what we've been seeing is is the impact on race and ethnicity and and when you were presenting I was yeah I was struck by how age has really come to the forefront, um, particularly with our older adults and, and where they live. And then also with race and ethnicity, of, of, it's not just urban and rural environments, but where the people, the different neighborhoods um, within, within, uh, within BC, it's become apparent. I'm, not, I'm, I'm sure the same is happening um, in Ontario where we're seeing um, different um, impacts of COVID based on um, geographic location. So I was just curious if, if there's been thought around there, how to how to kind of shift from this thinking of urban and, and rural to to a bit more intersectionality, I guess, around that. Yeah, it's definitely a space that Kai Hai um, is interested in. Um, we have we have some recommendations around looking at multiple stratifiers, but um, I completely agree with your comment about the conversation related to COVID. Um, you know, and, and some of the things to think about are looking at one particular measure is not going to tell you what else is going on behind it. So I know that many public health units were reporting on race um, as part of their COVID case pieces, but it, it doesn't tell you the story behind because race, race is not uh, the driver behind COVID. It's other things that are happening um, related to the social determinants of health. It might be the type of employment you have. It might be um, how you have to travel to work. It, you know, there are lots of other things behind the term race. So it can, it can help you identify something, but it's, you still need to do more of that digging to understand what is really going on behind that. COVID doesn't pick people because of their race. You know, COVID affects people because of other underlying determinants. Yeah, that, yeah, and that excellent point, because that's what I've been thinking around as well, is it's not the fact, it's not someone's um, individual characteristics that impacts it. It's all the social structures and behind that that is generating these inequities, right? So um, I want to encourage people to uh, type in some question and answers. I want to see a few more coming in. So um, there's um, a question from... And my apologies if I mispronounce your name, Amadou, um, regarding race or ethnicity equity, um, sorry, race or ethnicity uh, stratifier um, and why all black groups are combined together to one group as black while others are separated out. So why there was just, I, I, get, I don't know if you know the decision behind that is why. Um, I don't know the decision decision behind that. Uh, I'm sorry, I am newer to Kai Hai, so I don't have, I, I was not around for the initial piece. I will flag though that there is continued engagement to determine like, is this the right categorization? Are there recommendations for other ways to split things out? So they are draft, if they're not final standards. And so I think that's the important piece. And we, we um, Kai Hai recognized the need to get, make some draft standards out, which was really helpful for the COVID response for public health. They at least had something that they could collect uh, with a common standard, but also recognizing that there's still lots of dialogue that needs to happen to determine how should we really be separating that out. I think the other piece that's come up when you look at the Indigenous identity uh, one as well is that, um, you know, we're hearing lots of feedback to say, yeah, those are three categories, First Nation, uh, Métis and Inuit, However, um, there, there might be areas that want to collect it completely differently and that's okay. And, and that's part of the dialogue that needs to happen to, to make it meaningful for people. Yeah, great, thank you. Um, the other 
question um, that has come up around um, these different in index. So there's the around vulnerability or deprivation index and is Kaya working on a similar approach? I think it gets to that intersectionality piece as well. Um, yeah, so the, yeah um, we are not currently working on, um, you know, we're, we're aware of all the different indices. I think um, some of the caveats about the indices are again, um, you might have a grouping that identifies a certain outcome, but what is the driver behind it? You know, if, if one of your components includes low income and single parent and something else, and you're finding an association, how do you disaggregate that in order to figure out what action you need to take? Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, if the problem is, if the issue is associated mostly with uh, single parents, that might not have anything to do with one of the other factors. So I think, again, like there, there, when you're doing these kind of analyses, you have to look at it in many different ways, but you, you also need to be able to disaggregate. So those, those indices are great uh, in some instances, but you may also need to peel that back to determine what is really driving that outcome that you're seeing. Thanks. Um, and there's some, some questions around the, the stakeholder engagements. Um, so it'd be helpful to know for those of us who are developing surveys, um, how you, you're also following the OCAP principle. So OCAP is, um, I believe it from the First Nation perspective um, and, how, and how, how to actually share data back with the community and um, engage them. So. So, right, and what can you just repeat? Oh, the so what the question? Um, how you how you're actually thinking around those OCAP principles and bringing that into um, stakeholder stakeholder engagement? Yeah, so Kai Hai um, is taking the approach of no release of Indigenous data without um, that relationship with Indigenous uh, communities, definitely. So, um, so so and we are we are kind of at the early days of this journey. We are. Uh, meeting with lots of stakeholders to have these discussions about, about data, but I think the one premise that we need to put out there is that we don't release anything um, related to Indigenous groups without those conversations. And I know that that has come up with other um, other groups as well who, who ha have similar thoughts, and so that, that could be another area um, that, we're, that we hear from some of these engagement pieces. Great. Thanks so much. So there's, I'm going to keep going through all the questions. <laughs> so I just going to, there's, um, I, there's another question around um, impact on COVID measures um, and where people, um, based on where they're working or staying from home and, and the closing of, of gyms um, and how this may be increasing uh, the gap around inequality um, and, and um, the example of um, access to mental health services and that. So are there other measures, I guess, that, um, that, COVID has really revealed that Kapai is looking at around some of these other um, aspects. Yeah, Kai Hai has done, um, has quite a few pieces of work. If you do go onto the Kai Hai webpage, there are reports that have come out looking at some of these, um, some of these topics. So um, impact of COVID on falls, uh, impact of COVID on hospitalizations and ED visits. Um, I believe the, there's a substance substance use one in there too. I, I apologize if I haven't yeah. quite got that correct, but there are, there are a number of reports that have been released uh, where Kai Hai is, is trying to look at what are some of those impacts on um, population, like reduced surgeries and, and that sort of thing. So yeah. it's definitely high up on the radar to, to monitor and see what some of these uh, impacts were on uh, at least for health services. And um, you know, there are a lot, there are lots, public health is looking at a lot of other um, potential pieces as well. So it's, a, it's an area of an in interest that I think a variety of different groups will be engaging to measure after this pandemic is done. Like what were some of those other impacts mm -hmm. from a social end, health behaviors and even health outcomes? Yeah, yeah. Great. And yeah, and I'm all, yeah, and my background's um, within senior cells. I'm, yeah, really curious of, of, yeah, what we can do to, to shift um, some of the impacts around that as well. So that's great. Um, the other question is how to address the issue of forming and collecting identifiers when power dynamics, such as the political and legal, also align with co colonial efforts to control First Nations communities. So um, I guess some of the 
aspects around um, colonialism, I've read around being a social determinant of health itself. So how do you address some of those issues of collecting, um, I guess, indigenous identifiers when the, there might be existing power dynamics around um, these colonial structures? Mm -hmm. A great, great question as well. And I think um, Kai Hai does ha has a has an ethic framework that uh, will be used to um, to start testing against some of these new collection pieces to ask some of those questions to make sure that are we going to be are we doing more harm than good by asking are we you know engaging with the, including the right individuals so I think for any kinds of new data collection. Um, using that kind of ethical framework thinking will be is really important and uh, it's great that Kai Hai is is well on its way to start implementing that. Yeah, yeah. so and uh, this is a another question for um, a link to that was um, are there specific Indigenous stakeholders being engaged with um, that you're engaging with and can you share um, who you are engaging with or um, is it I guess across provinces um, uh, or and territories or I don't know if you can share that information so yeah, yeah unfortunately I'm sorry I don't know the answer to that question mm -hmm. um, in terms of the details but I can certainly connect um, connect you with the name of our, our the manager in our indigenous uh, for our indigenous health team who could certainly provide more details on um, some of those engagements and relationships that Kai Hai is has with indigenous all right great and um, I think yeah so I believe your contact information is it um, how, I guess that's a question how, how best to um, reach reach you or is it yeah, I guess have has the best way to follow up on that piece. Uh, if you would, yeah, I'm happy to okay. share with you via email yeah. the name okay. of that person, however you want to share it, but um, yeah. Perfect. Um, and then there was a question earlier in the chat window that I just remembered was, um, I know that you showed the, the video and it's available, I think, on YouTube and Kai Hai's site, right? And there was a, a second video that you were wanting to show, but because of limited time, we weren't able to. And um, what was that one? It, I know there was a link to, to the one that you'd shown, but it's slightly different. So what yeah, it gets more into the uh, inequality measures. So if you want to understand better about, you know, the rate difference and the rate ratio and what does it mean and how do I need to think about it, uh, that video gets more into detail on the actual, um, those measures and yeah. work you through a bit of an exercise. So okay. um, I thought, yeah, just there wasn't enough time to show that, but yeah. certainly if you are interested more in that analytical uh, end, that would be a great video to watch. Well. Perfect. And I think they're both on YouTube, right? That's where I found, found them. So yeah. They're also, yeah, they're also available on the Kai Hai website. If you just Google health inequalities or health equity, Kai Hai, there, all those resources and videos are available. Excellent. That's great. Um, how do you, so I'll jump back to the, the questions in the Q&A. Uh, how do you see the role of Kai Hai in implementing the use of equity strat stratifiers across the country? Um, example where they're almost not collected for COVID-19. Um, uh, yeah, no, and it's a great question. I mean, I think the thing to think about is a lot of our health systems weren't designed with these stratifiers in mind, right? They were built many years ago. Uh, it's it's very expensive and not, we might think it's easy to make a change into a system like that, but it's not. So, um, so when we don't have that kind of information embedded within a database, we by high is looking at different ways, are there different ways that we can try to bring that stratifier into the database? So the example that I gave in the slide deck around those area-based measures, um, we even income um, has been added into some of our databases as an area-based measure to kind of help get around some of those problems where you, you just, you simply cannot collect some of them. Um, education is another one that we are exploring and then we will need to start thinking about things like how do you how do you get gender in or clarify that when it's different across systems and then how do you get in kind of things like um, race or ethnicity indigenous identity so there's there's still so much work to be done, but you know, small headway in getting a few of these uh, stratifiers into the database. Yeah. Given that you're working with very um, 
large system uh, and yeah. very different systems across the provinces and territory. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, just with the, the working group and, develop, and thinking around developing standards, I've been doing a, a scan and I, it's, that's the thing, where do you start? Because there's so many that you could look at. Um, and uh, so, yeah, I think the ones that you started with are, are some key key ones. Um, and it kind of falls up to a question around, have you also looked at immigration status? And I know this is one of the questions in the um, the tool that um, has been developed through the SPARC study um, is around um, immigration status. I can't remember the exact question, but um, has Kai looked at that as well? So. No, we haven't looked at it yet, but it was um, when, when Kai Hai did the Pan-Canadian Dialogue, there was like the first block of um, stratifiers uh, that were age, sex, gender, income, education, geography was the first block. So um, we worked on developing standards for those. Then there was like a second grouping. Um, immigrant status was included within that. And so one of the things that we will be doing this year is a bit of an assessment to, ter to determine which, which one of those should we start working on next. So, you know, of course that in includes what did we hear from stakeholders and what's gonna be most important. So, yeah. um, but it was, it was one of the ones that was on the list. Perfect, all right. Um, so I have two more questions and then um, I think that we, We'll wrap up, but I, and um, before I do, actually, I'll ask the two questions, and then I think Francis might have a question as well. So um, I'll see if he wants to to ask it at the end. But um, one of them, the one question is, why was one of the criterion for selecting health equity variables that the system could access it correct? Um, most structural terms are outside the healthcare system, which makes them a wicked problem. Why, why did Kaya decide to focus on income and not occupation and, and how does the healthcare system correct for income inequality? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's <laughs> that's a, you have 30 seconds. It's, it's, the, million, it's the million dollar question. Yeah. No, I yeah. know. And I, I think it's trying to find, I think it's trying to find, if somebody, it's finding those opportunities for your organization. So the example that that I think is easiest to think about is if you know that um, if, if many of your clients, let's say, are in, in lower income, you can't maybe necessarily correct the problem of structural, whatever, wherever that is. But, but you could potentially connect them to resources. Have you filed your taxes? Did you know you can get these additional rebates? So just knowing that that is, is existing in someone's life, you could maybe connect them to other other resources that are out there. And I, I know that's kind of a simplistic view to it, but it's because that piece is really big. And I think that's where people get stuck. So it's trying to figure out what can I do? What can I do in my organization if I had that information to help inform a change for that person? Yeah. 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 That's, um, that's what I've also found is there's the poverty tool, which you can ask people, are you having difficulties making and meet? And then it can, and then if people respond, yes, you can link them to, to different services. Right. And instead of, yeah, thinking that you have to change their income, you can change, you can provide additional support. Yeah. Around, right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then what knowledge translation initiatives does Kai Hai have in place to action the data coming in? Um, so the data that you're collecting in that, yeah. Yeah, so Kai Hai routinely reports on a variety of different indicators across many of the different databases. Uh, those are available um, in, in something called Your Health System. So that's accessible online. There are, are different degrees of access, but um, certainly there are public facing pieces. Um, and then there are other data that get published in reports and um, whatnot that would be available for public consumption. So those are the two yeah. that come to, to yeah. mind. I know that we're coming yeah. close to time here, but yeah. Yeah, yeah. They're great. And, and I think all the resources that you linked in, in your pre presentation provide some excellent resources too. Great. Um, and then I'll also say Kai Hai has been great at um, promoting this event too. So there's all the the, net, the hidden networks, I think, that we, that we often, um, yeah, through social media and that. So, so Francis, do you, do you want to ask your question or, or has it been answered? Um, there are actually a couple of uh, questions from the uh, participants in the chat box. Okay. Uh, I'll leave it to you to decide because the time right. is running Yeah, running time is up. Um, I'm just going to see if the, see if the in the chat box. Um, I 
there are quite a few. Um, Julie, would it, would it work um, if I forward these questions on to you and, and then we can send um, a response out to the group um, okay. about uh, some questions around around these questions? Or yeah, I, I, really, I like that idea. Yeah. That would be great. Yeah, and, uh, it, you know, and thank you everybody for all of your questions. This is, it's great to have these kind of conversations and um, uh, it'll be, if there's things in here that we can take away, that'll be great too. So that would be helpful. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. And what I also want to say is, um, yeah, it's just the start of, I guess, of what we're discussing. And, and that's really um, part of this is to launch the social terms health working group. So these are excellent questions for me to think about, too, and in, in thinking about how to design the working group. Um, and yeah, Julie, I just really want to thank you so much for all the all the time you spent with us today and um, and the questions, because they like, like one of the questions came up. These are wicked problems we're dealing with. And mm -hmm. so how do we really address these? And so I really appreciate your time and and, and um, all your insights around this. So thank Wonderful. you. Thank you and looking forward to uh, the next speakers. Yeah, great. So we're going to take um, a seven minute break uh, or, um, and um, start up right at 10 a.m. Um, uh, Pacific time um, and uh, do my math, one o'clock um, in the afternoon for, for some of you. And then four, I guess, on um, two o'clock for people on the other side of the, the water. So great. Um, Talk soon. Thank you. Talk soon.